Being in the moment is the goal, because when you become present, then you become grateful. All of the studies that have been done on gratitude that point to higher levels of subjective well-being, less depression, less stress, more satisfaction with life. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Okay, Louis Schwartzberg, welcome to the Commune podcast. I'm so grateful to be with you. Great to be here with you, Jeff. So the other night I, I was mentioning to you yesterday um, that I had the opportunity to host a little party, a watch party um, for your new piece de resistance. I'm, I'm practicing my French because I leave for Paris tomorrow um, called Gratitude Revealed. And um, it's just a magnificent film, Louis. Um, and uh, thank you for, for your work over the decades, but particularly for this this piece. And since watching it, um, I've been engaging in a variety of gratitude practices. And it is amazing that in a very short period of time, I feel this greater sense of effusiveness and beneficence. Um, and, and I really credit the movie for being a bit of like an inflection point there for it. And uh, of course, the film is right on time because... This is the season. Um, just to timestamp our conversation here, we're speaking just a week before Thanksgiving, and you know this is a, a time that is characteristic of slowing down a little bit and hunkering down with family and doing more cooking um, and appreciating the smaller things in life. So I'm very excited to excavate all the dimensions of gratitude and its relationship with generosity and wonder and nature and maybe even some of the practices that that you engage in and I'll share some of mine. But um, I wonder maybe if we could start here. There is a wonderful part of the film where you talk about the experience of being a cinematographer and a director and part of that is a part of that is experience is focusing on one thing and obscuring something else. So I was wondering, what was the inspiration to focus on this topic of gratitude? Well, the, the section you're talking about, I think I'm talking about focus. And um, I have a problem with that in my life, actually. I mean, I, I, I get so inspired by ideas when you brainstorm, and then you want to do them. And so I know that I, I probably spread myself too thin in doing too many things. But in the movie, what I did was I used the cinematographer's point of view to use it as a metaphor for focus in terms of making choices in your life that are important and, um, and having everything else be a distraction. So I showed that by, you know, shallow depth of field. You know, I focus on a close-up of a spider when everything else goes out of focus or a hummingbird flying toward camera and everything the background is out of focus. The value of that is that your eye goes right to the hummingbird. And as a cinematographer and the filmmaker, you direct the eye to where you want the audience to observe. But at the same time, it's a metaphor for life. You know, what is most important? in the choices that are in front of you. And, and perhaps choice is the most powerful power you have, you know, to choose what is important in your life. You just mentioned like Thanksgiving's around the corner, but you know, choosing to be with friends and family, having that, the joy of cooking a meal, um, or, you know, it's like making those choices it's how you, you know, art direct your life. You know, we can get into uh, philosophical debates around the nature of determinism and, and free will. But what I've often found is that we do have some agency moment to moment of where to focus our attention. And there's like this wonderful Thich Nhat Hanh quote of when you do the dishes, do the dishes, right? right. And there seems to be an element of gratitude or happiness 
which is aligning your thoughts with your actions and being present in that way. And I'm wondering, as part of your creative process, do you find that that phenomenon when you really are able to align your intention with action? Definitely. But I, th- I think that what you said earlier, um, the goal of like the goal of almost every spiritual practice is to be present, you know, and like you say, when, when Thich Nhat Hanh, you know, wash the dishes, wash the dishes, don't have your mind thinking about the past or the future, what you have to do and what you'd rather not be doing than the dishes. And so becoming present, being in the moment is the goal, right? Be here now. And that's what I think gratitude is for me because when you become present then you become grateful um grateful for the little things in life um grateful that you're alive grateful that you're breathing grateful for this moment um it's the essence i think of being conscious um and it's very difficult in, in you know in our culture and our society now to, to ever become present um and and I think that's the the battle we have now because we have, you know, all this like you know um, competition for your attention, you know, your eyeballs. It becomes now the new currency. It's more important than money. Is like how many eyeballs do you have? You know, how many followers do you have? How many likes do you have? And that becomes a battle of attention. And attention is the same word as consciousness. So if I have you. And unfortunately, we know politicians do this, you know, with fear and being vulgar. I can grab your attention by being gross, you know? I mean, that's an easy thing to do. It takes art to make you laugh, to make you cry, to, to grab your emotions that celebrate beauty and life. But the only way, to, I think, to combat the the fear and the anxiety and the, and the vulgar, you know, conversations of politics is to be able to have an emotion that's more powerful than that. And I think that would be beauty, wonder, and awe. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because we know that gratitude um, through all sorts of clinical research and uh, this guy, Martin Seligman, who kind of pioneered, um, you know, positive psychology and you know, all of the studies that have been done on gratitude that point to higher levels of subjective well-being, uh, less depression, less stress, more satisfaction with life, uh, higher levels of, of purpose and growth. We know all of these things, yet we are experiencing in our culture these cresting rates of depression and loneliness and I think, you know, you, you speak right to the core of the issue is that we are not cognitively designed to manage all of the input coming at us. And what you refer, re, what you refer to as, as the attention economy, which is constantly leveraging your negativity bias while vying for your attention moment to moment in order to maximize clicks and engagement and watch time generally for the purposes of selling ads but sometimes for the purpose of of garnering influence and this is making basically our culture is inhibiting us from being able to cultivate true gratitude a lot of the time yeah and so for me gratitude enables me to pull me out of that negative spiral you know, you watch the news, you know, and you can get really depressed. And for me, it's a go-to that when I start finding myself being depressed, being rejected, feeling like a victim, happens to all of us all the time, happens to me, I should say. I don't know about all of us. I'm a human being. And when I think about what can I be grateful for, well, immediately I think about I have five fingers that move, that I'm breathing. I got a trillion cells in my body that are working in harmony. Like it's only when you lose your health that you become grateful for the fact that you're healthy, you know? And so I've discovered 
that you can't have a negative thought and a positive thought in your mind at the same time. So as soon as I think of something that's positive, it shuts down that negative feed that's going in my head, that that spiral, that rumination that we all get stuck in. And it pulls me out of the that feeling of being like I'm drowning, you know? And and just being pulled out of it and going in this, it's it's like a it's a baby step, perhaps, in the direction of of thinking positive. It's enough to stop that negative energy. And then I realize, okay, you know, what I was doing, I get a little bit more perspective. And I, and I start to think about, you know, what can I be grateful for? My children, my family. I mean, come on. There's so many things we can be grateful for that um, it brings me back to being alive, being back to being present, which brings you back to being grateful for the fact that I'm just here. Beautifully put. Um, as I mentioned, you know, since watching the film, I've been on high alert for moments of gratitude. <laughs> and um, I'm an avid tennis player. And I, I played um, at a pretty high level in, in school. And since moving to Los Angeles, I've, you know, revivified my my tennis career, <laughs> as pathetic as that might sound. Um, and I'm always challenging people half my age. But I was out there, um, you know, playing this morning, getting my ass kicked. But I didn't care. And I really stopped at this moment between a, a game and I, I engaged in this um, stoic practice. So I'm super into stoicism and the whole pursuit of eudaimonia, the, the good life. And stoicism is funny because there's all these negative visualization techniques that, that you can use to essentially invoke a state of gratitude. So I played this little game with myself and I said, what if this was the very last time I ever played tennis. I love hitting this yellow fuzzy ball around. It's basically like my, I mean, I have a meditation practice too, but it is like cognitive absence for me. I turn into like a canine. I just care about the flight of this fuzzy yellow orb. <laughs> and I just stopped and the sun was shining and my heart was beating and I was 100% like all there. And I said, oh my God, I have so much gratitude for this moment. I love being able to be outside and active and my body is functioning. And guess what? This isn't the last time. I get to play again tomorrow. <laughs> and it really, and, um, and that negative visualization was really useful to kind of bring me into this place of like, wow, I really treasure this. And of course, you can apply that same practice to the next time that, you know, you talk to your kids on the phone or the next time you cook dinner with your wife or whatever situation you have. It can be very prosaic, honestly. Um, but, uh, but to be there right now is such a gift. And, uh, and we're often not there. Right. It takes, as you know, meditation practices, I, I suppose, because I don't do it rigorously, but I try to be present as much as I can. Um, for me, like in the morning, I wake up, I check my time-lapse flower room and to see if the flowers opened or didn't open. It gets me out of bed. Um, and I'm grateful for that. It's just, a, you know, again, it, it's really hard to be present nowadays more than ever, as we, we talked about. And, you know, gratitude in, engenders the appreciation for what you feel, I think, in the moment. And as I said at the end of my movie, I think gratitude is what you remember that warms your heart. When you think back to the Thanksgiving dinner that you had, when you look back at the moments when your kid was a baby and you see a baby picture and you get this warm feeling inside of you, just grateful for all of those things. So, yeah. Absolutely. I actually carry a little baby picture. I have three daughters. I think you have two. So I think we're shooting X chromosomes. Yeah, I carry pictures <laughs> uh, too in my wallet. They're tattered. Are yours tattered? Yeah, totally. They're ta They're all torn up around the edges, but I call them sort of my trump card because 
you know, in moments of kind of depression or distraction, you know, I can pull it out and it immediately pulls me out of my kind of little pathetic self-pity and being like, oh my God, come on, Jeff, get, get over yourself for a second. Look at this incredible creature. And I think it also points out to all the little things we commonly take for granted. What happened with the pandemic made it really clear. Did you ever, you know, uh, we took for granted having dinner with your friends and family. Wow. You know, um, when whoever thought that would disappear, you know, so it's, it's only like when things disappear that you really cherish the things that are most important to you. And I think we have to, you know, put a little bit of effort into reminding ourselves of the little things we do take for granted. Again, as I mentioned in my movie, my parents were Holocaust survivors. So every time I get down, I think about what they went through and I go, give, give, give me a break here. Like, what, you got rejected? Uh, somebody like said something wrong to you that you, was, that you found insulting? Um, it, you know, you just have to have a little bit of a perspective on, on life and, and you called it a trump card, <laughs> but it's true. It's it, call it an ace, ace in the hole. Having this thing in my back pocket, it's really a miracle. I have nothing else that I can say that is, I can solidly rely on to pull me out of a negative spiral. You know, it's really miraculous. Um, because when I, it's so now that I'm kind of conditioned that I realize that I'm going down that rabbit hole of feeling bad, you know, which we all kind of do occasionally. It's amazing. I just think of this, you know, capital letter G that stands for gratitude. And there I go, you know, I start searching and especially if I'm outside and being visual, you know, I look for the light that's bouncing off the leaf of that tree. And I look at a crack in the sidewalk. I look at things that are, you know, touch my soul. I can find it anywhere. I can find it in the alley, you know, and that becomes an adventure, uh, a journey into like discovering the beauty that surrounds me. And, and then that inspires wonder and curiosity, which is, I think, the intersection between art and science. And so bingo, I'm on this journey and I'm back to being me and, and you know, soaking up life. Yeah, you have a, a way of cultivating your inner child. And that's something that, to be honest, I'm always chasing, um, you know, myself to kind of maintain that sense of wonder. You know, when I, I think about, I, I read, um, you know, um, uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe to all my three daughters. And so I, I know that book pretty well. And I when Lucy you know, opens the wardrobe and, and then, you know, all of a sudden she's into this wonderland of Narnia um, and she can't wait to tell her siblings about it. And then, of course, she goes to open the wardrobe again and it's just not there the, the next time. And, you know, it's that uh, that curiosity that keeps us coming back and exploring. And, you know, we talked a little bit about how the attention economy um, contributes to distraction. Well, one of the other things it erodes is patience. And you are the encapsulation of patience. And one of the points that you made in the film that I thought was um, so insightful is that nature specifically requires patience. Can you pull on that thread a little bit? Yeah, well, again, everyone's always remarking about, you know, the beautiful time-lapse, you know, flowers that I shoot, and you have to be patient. It could take you three or four days to get like a four or five second shot of a flower growing and opening. And what I really talk about is it takes trust, which I kind of learned that from Jack Hornfield, that patience and trust are really connected because what I'm doing is I'm leaning into the intention that that flower will open up in frame, that it will be in focus, that it will be a beautiful shot. And um, nature will provide, you know, if I, if I trust, you know. So that's what it really has taught me. It, the, the patience and trust are intertwined in a really beautiful way. Another component 
to nature is that within nature there is a natural arising of what is known as a coincidentia positorum or the coincidence of opposites where you know you will have seasons of growth and then you will have seasons of decay and repair i mean you made a whole movie about decay basically um called fantastic fungi not really just about decay but um no but but it, it can be well, it's called either decay, but it's either the beginning of life or the end of life, but life's a circle, you know? So, you know, when things break down to their basic elements, it's for regeneration, for rebirth. And so it's just how you look at it, but it's a circle. Yeah. Yeah. Nature promises a spring with every winter. Um, and I think when you become an, a student of nature, you surrender to this notion that life is as much falling apart as it is being reborn. And one of the other really insightful, very moving pieces of the film was the idea that, that you can be grateful for the things that you have and uh, and there's also another stoic practice called loving what you have, and maybe we'll talk about that later. But there is also gratitude to be had in suffering. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because that seems, it does not seem obvious at first. I love the line that Jack Kornfield says, like his, you know, his Tibetan Buddhist teachers it said that it, it's when you suffer that you open your heart and and that you know it's not when you're like bouncing around everything's great but what what gives you character are the challenges in your life and i love the line when he says um, and you don't have to pray for it it will come <laughs> yes exactly <laughs> and so i remember um, that line it's yeah. so good like <laughs> yeah i don't don't worry you have to pray for it it will come because they pray for it the buddhists pray for it, which is really interesting. And so, look, I've gone through some, you know, tough things occasionally in my life, and I've learned that it, it does open your heart in a much broader way. To experience, you know, the ups and downs only makes you appreciate joy and happiness more. You know, um, it, it does broaden your perspective, and it makes you a deeper, more caring, more compassionate human being. Without suffering, you really can't be compassionate. Suffering helps cultivate compassion, or what Jack might refer to as karuna, which is really the identification of someone else's suffering as your own. But if you hadn't experienced it, the cultivation of that feeling is much more difficult to put your thumb on. I mean, it's also, I, would, I don't know, the, the difference between that and empathy, you know, like feeling bad for somebody else doesn't help them or you, right? Uh, compassion is the proper way to, I think, to deal with that kind of a situation. Yeah. Well, empathy doesn't have a particular valence per se. I mean, you could be happy for someone else's happiness, which is also a beautiful thing. Um, or sad for someone else's sadness, or um, but compassion, I believe, is a higher emotion um, than empathy because it is really about um, identifying someone else's suffering as your own, but with a positive action to bring relief to that suffering. And uh, what the Buddhists might call metta, bringing loving kindness forward. Um, it, it's funny, Jack brought to my attention a particular kind of um, Buddhist meditation called Marana Sati, which is the Stoics think of as memento mori, but it, essentially it's meditations on your own mortality. <laughs> and, um, and so you sit in remembering your own death and um and again it's a bit of a it, it can sound morbid but it's only morbid if you fail to really see the point 
because in sitting with your own inevitable mortality, again, you become more thankful and more appreciative to, for the fact that you are here and alive in the moment. And there's a whole medi- you know, genre of meditation uh, dedicated to that, which again is a little morose, but, but, the, but the point is to invoke um, gratitude. You know, one, one of the other um, debates that we had, not really debates, but discussion that we had around the table a- after watching the film was how do you move from gratitude as a state to gratitude as a trait? So, and I'll try to just color that a tiny bit of like, there are practices that you can engage in to elicit moments, you know, maybe fleeting moments of gratitude. But there do seem to be people that where gratitude is essentially become a bottom up behavior, um, where it is a trait and becomes completely, uh, it perfumes your whole life. And that maybe is is cubbyhole for just the enlightened people. <laughs> but I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that idea. Well, I think you see it in my movie in all the extraordinary, remarkable people that I filmed who are not famous. And basically, I selected people who had stories, um, who have passion and love in their lives and who have overcome adversity but still have that emotion. I think passion for what you do and what you love to do is how you embody gratitude in every breath you take. Yeah, I love the stories, um, the untold stories that you managed to excavate. I mean, there are um, obviously luminaries in the film like Paul Hawken and Deepak Chopra and Jack Kornfield and Lynn Twist and stuff, but the most compelling parts of the documentary for me anyways were the like septuagenarian acrobats and uh there is a a whole number of scenes about um this uh a, a number of women prisoners who are engaged in a improv um routine it's just so wonderful so how how do you find these stories louis I'm really, I love to tell stories about people who overcome adversity and have love in their life based on the fact that my parents were Holocaust survivors and they had a lot of love in their life. And I find that to be super inspirational. And so in the last 20 years, every time I was traveling across the country, I was looking for these stories. Um, before the internet, um, I would you know, ask local you know, TV stations, local newspapers, who was an interesting character, you know, in that region. If I found myself in Vermont, I talked to the dairy farmer, found myself in the Mississippi Delta, you know, speaking with Mosey Burke, a gospel singer. And again, it's pretty easy to to ask people like what they're passionate about. And um, it's, it just exudes this energy of, I'm just so grateful that I'm alive, even though I'm not famous. You know, I'm having a giant impact on the world. And and I think, you know, now more than ever, we've really fallen into this terrible, you know, uh, celebrity worshiping thing, influencer thing. You can be a teenager now and be an influencer. And um, it's, you know, most of the people I film are older. And I never really looked for people that were older, but it really helps to have a little bit of mileage under your belt in order to have a little bit of wisdom, you know? And um, so those were the stories that attracted me, as well as the fact that I wanted it to be visual. It just couldn't be someone who was a great, you know, software programmer, you know. Um, it, It needed to be for me, you know, it was something I could film outdoors. And look, my dad was a blue collar worker, you know. I love blue collar workers. <laughs> I mean, you know, the salt of the earth, the, the work ethic. Um, that Those are stories that inspire me. 
One theme that seems to run across all of those stories, and I think specifically of the blues guitar player and the barber, you know, these guys in this particular case, you know, he has just a little barber shop in, you know, somewhere that you've never heard of. And the guitar player was just completely satisfied and fulfilled with playing like the local juke joint. You know what I mean? It was like there were, he wasn't chasing anything. He wasn't craving or striving. And like you say, everywhere we look, we're meant to feel inferior. There, There are these images of unattainable perfection. We don't look good enough. We don't have enough wealth, et cetera. And that creates this culture of craving and you know we say to ourselves like if only and it and only if like i get that role in that movie well then i'll be happy but of course the second we get that role there's a new shiny object that appears on the horizon and then you know we get on this hedonic treadmill and the stories that you manage to tell are really just fly in the face of that of, of instead of craving or wanting more, a a lot of these folks just recognize that their needs are completely met and that, you know, in the absence of need, your energy becomes focused outward and becomes munificent and beneficent. And, you know, love really becomes something given and not just taken. And you encapsulate those stories with such grace and beautiful turns of phrase. It's such a delight. Thank you. They're little jewels. And and when you become the caretaker of these stories, it's a responsibility, you know, to share them. And um, I'm glad that, um, I, you know, during COVID, I could have gotten film. I've been, you know, banking a lot of this material for a long time. The universe said, now's the time for it to happen. Because coming out of COVID, we, we learned a lot about disconnection alienation, you know, not only from each other, but from, you know, environmental degradation, um, political discourse, all this stuff was happening that really put us into a really, people think we're going to have this big mental health crisis looming around the corner. And so to be able to, you know, dig through my little archive of treasures and, you know, pull these jewels out and figure out how to make a story out of it, how one links to the other, because all these values for me add up to gratitude, generosity, curiosity, creativity, wonder, love. Um, you know, it, all of these things add up, I think, to the umbrella emotion of gratitude. And I'm not a positive psychologist. I'm not a religious expert or spiritual anything. I'm just a filmmaker. But those values are the ones that, you know, you can really focus on and tell a beautiful story, but the overarching story is about gratitude. Hmm. It's funny, um, in contemplating you (laughs) in preparation for this conversation, um, I started thinking about you as a pollinator of stories. (laughs) Well, I did, I did Wings of Life, you know, which I don't know if you were looking for that, but that story was all about pollination, which I thought was the foundation of life, you know, the intersection between, you know, the animal world and the plant world. But to be a pollinator is like really a giant compliment, you know, because you are the connector. Absolutely. And, you know, you arise in complete mutual interdependence with the flower and I, I imagined you as a as a bee or a bat, um, you know, you know, finding the stamen of ideas and taking it out and spreading it far and wide, um, and and bringing uh, kind of amplifying these beautiful little stories that you know would never otherwise be amplified. And I, I can only imagine the great joy that you brought people well um, you know what's really cool jeff is that some of those characters have, have passed uh minnie yancey the appalachian woman who was weaving for example she was great but she's no longer here so think how cool it is that i can share the story with you and with the world you know 
where I had this magic moment with her as she's weaving, talking about working rows back and forth as Albert out there is working in his tractor back and forth. And she, and she brings this beautiful connection together of, you know, how she needs to, you know, become more self-disciplined and I need to learn that. I mean, the fact that, I mean, it's a miracle. She's no longer here, you know? And I, here I'm giving you this magic moment, this real-time moment, not like an actor that died and played a role. I'm talking about a real moment in time, a magic moment. And that's what these are. These are magic moments. Not all of life is magic moments. You know that, right? There are little peaks and valleys. And what's cool about filmmaking I shot 300 hours and I'm going to show you 80 minutes, you know, those are the peak moments, <laughs> you know? And so that a fact, it's kind of a cool miracle that I can not only share it with you, it's something that is eternal now, you know, it, it lived 20 years ago. It happened 20 years ago, <clears throat> but you get to experience it on your own in real time, you know, without me being there. That's really a mind blower, you know? And I'm just grateful that I'm able to like share that energy. Um, I still have a hard time really kind of wrap my head around it. If, if you understand what I'm saying, it's these are magic moments that I put together on, a, on a, like pearls on a string. And you are able to create context and meaning based on your own prior personal life experience as to what it means. I mean, here we are talking a lot about gratitude. We're doing like philosophical, you know, um, riffing back and forth. But in the movie, I don't tell anybody how to live their life. I don't tell anyone to practice gratitude. You're just looking at examples of people who, like Lynn Twist is generous, like the rug weaver who's talking about self-discipline or the, you know, the, the blind ice climber you know, who talks about reaching out into the darkness. He's not telling you what to do. That's really important, you know, and it, it's like looking into a mirror, looking into your own soul and saying, what can I learn from this experience? What can I take to heart and and make my life better? Yeah, great storytelling shows. It doesn't tell. Yes. And it's um, with any piece of art when it's just right here in your journal or in your computer then it's really all yours but the moment that you press publish right it really becomes a million films or however many people watch it in your case tens and hundreds of millions because everyone brings their own experience to it i know and you know what's great jeff we've had a lot of they knock, I mean, great re reviews, you know, critic reviews. One, one critic, a critic is a critic. That means he's a bit judgmental. Um, he called himself a curmudgeon. And he goes, what do we need a film about gratitude? Rah, 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 you know? And, <laughs> and, and I'm going, oh, my God, this is going to be terrible. I, I, you know, and then about a couple of paragraphs in, he said it changed his life watching the movie. Hmm. He started off in a very negative point of view just by the title Gratitude Revealed was enough to get him going, you know? And so I really love the fact that I think the film is a mirror into our soul. And every time I hear like the positive stuff, it's just a reflection of who that individual is. Every time you know, we do a screening I'm, and luckily I'm there for a Q&A or something, people come up to me and they're gushing and they're crying and they're going, oh my God, how beautiful and you're so amazing. I go, no, you are amazing. You know, you've got the big heart. You took it all the way in, you know, you started crying, you know, there's nothing really sad in the movie. It touched your soul. And I appreciate the fact you're feeling it in a deep way. I love you for that. You're great. You know, when I cried in the movie, <laughs> I do. I'm the guess. I, I think the animation was it the animation part with the old couple. Exactly. So you nailed it. Um, so I, I know Adam pretty well. Oh, so cool. There's a poet, a poet named NQ. And um, I hadn't seen that bit, that animation in, in a couple of years. But so I've, I've been with my better half, better three quarters, I call her for 
36 years now. And, um, and uh, I couldn't imagine living without her really, you know? Um, it's funny, my, my daughter a few years ago, I was, as I was putting her to bed, as I mentioned, I always read to them when I put them to bed. And she asked me, uh, Daddy, if you could have one wish, what would it be? And, uh, you know, it really stumped me and I took it away. I didn't have an answer for her. And three or four nights later, I said, I think I have an answer for you, Micah. That's my little one, Micah. And it, it sounds a little bit morose, but I said, you know, my wish is that your mommy and I, a long time from now, will die on the same day. And um, watching that animation kind of brought me back to that moment and that wish. Um, that, and it brought me back to this time right now that she doesn't have to be gone for me to really love her or miss her. Or um, there's this concept, again, in Stoicism that I've, I've been drilling into called present moment nostalgia. And you're, you're probably old enough to remember Carly Simon. She had this song called Anticipation. It's a wonderful song. And there's a refrain at the end that goes... Uh, and these are the good old days. These are the good old days. Sorry, not a singer, obviously. Um, but that line, these are the good old days. You know, obviously we, we experience nostalgia, which literally means our pain. But we experience nostalgia as this kind of delightful wistfulness that happens in the past. But what I've been trying to exercise is present moment nostalgia, where you can actually have that feeling for now. Right. <laughs> Maybe you could talk about beauty for a minute. Sure. There is a line that you have, which I've heard you say, which is beauty is nature's tool for survival. I love that. How did you land on that? It's because I think beauty motivates us to, you know, do the dance of life. And, um, you know, whether it's like reproduction or watching pollinators, you know, pollinate a flower, if that doesn't, it's, it's like DNA wants to move forward and it uses beauty to orchestrate that grand dance of life. And, when you think about it, it's a genius move because everything in the universe wears out. Nothing lasts forever. So nature comes up with this incredible invention called reproduction. And you're able to overcome entropy, right? And we are just one link in a giant chain going back to your ancestry, you know, on this evolution called life. And so... When I say beauty is nature's tool for survival because we protect what we love, it also means we're hardwired to keep that thing going. You love your children. You know, it's unconditional love. You love puppies. You love kittens. You love them because they're cute. Why are they cute? Because we are hardwired to nurture something that is young to grow and to evolve so it can make a, a baby someday. And, you know, so from a scientific point of view, it's not very romantic to say that DNA wants to go forward, right? On the other hand, you could say that love makes the world go round, you know, to be a little bit more romantic about it. But um, we're hardwired to do it. And I think beauty, unfortunately, has been hijacked, you know, with, you know, Madison Avenue and uh, getting, you know, people to buy, you know, to be consumers and, we're hardwired to love and we're hardwired to respond to, 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 to things that are beautiful, whether it's color, shape, design, sound, aroma, you know, we're, it, it is again, scientific word would be manipulation. Um, art would say emotional, you know, uh, connections, 
And um, I'm fascinated by it. I'm fascinated like why I feel a certain way if I look at a beautiful landscape. I'm fascinated why I feel a certain way if a beautiful woman walks by, you know? Um, what is it about her that is intriguing me? And I hope I can say that. It's not a sexist thing, I, I, I think, because I'm just fascinated with anything that's beautiful. I can find a fire hydrant to be beautiful, okay? You know, it, it all depends on why it connects with me. I want. I ask why. It isn't just, oh, it's pretty, move on. And one other thing, I think it relates to the movie. People say, oh, my God, you know, your film is so beautiful. You know, the cinematography is really beautiful. Duh. <laughs> it's like, it's the secret. It's part of the story, dude. You know, I'm seducing you to fall in love with these people. I'm not going to shoot you in ugly light. I'm not going to shoot you silhouetted in black. I'm going to shoot you with light that, that enhances your story. And that is an emotional trigger that I'm pressing inside of you that you are you, you don't have to be conscious of. But that's what I'm doing. I'm enhancing. Just like I enhance the story with music in the background that you're not always conscious of that adds an emotional, you know, level of, 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 of relevance or, or, or a deeper understanding or the sound effects, you know, um, all of it adds up to, I want to give you the most powerful emotional connection I possibly can deliver. Yeah. Well, this is why we're so attracted to, epiphanous art we want to be manipulated we yeah. want to be carried away we want to be all in and um and, and and you don't disappoint in that regard i mean you know sometimes when i'm you know um immerse myself in nature and I'll, and that could just be like i live in laurel canyon it could just be right here taking a hike in my neighborhood and I'm the freak like on the side of the, on the sidewalk that's kind of kneeling down with their nose in some plant <laughs> and like people are like, is that guy okay? Um, um, I'm more than okay though. Cause I'm, I'm often, there's these wonderful white roses up, up here, just up here. And they just are so aromatic that even if I just stop and smell them for a minute when I'm walking up to the top of Mulholland, I'm just, oh my God. I mean, this is like, what is the improbability of something being so redolent and or aromatic? I mean, that is just amazing. They're, the only proper response is gratitude at that juncture. Totally, totally. And it, it's, it's good to relish it because we don't, like we just move on to the next thing, the next thing, the next problem. And you, like, you know, like that old trite phrase, you know, stop and smell the roses is really true. And I, I dwell in it. Like, actually, it's really interesting with aroma. You can smell the rose once or twice and it's gone because your, your olfactory nerves, they need to recharge. It's almost like making love. You just can't make love all day long. <laughs> you need a bit of a recharge. But with the, because smell is so powerful. That, 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 that sensual feeling of, of aromatherapy, um, it would be pretty addictive if you had that intense first inhale over and over. It's really an interesting. I mean, try it next time you go by those white roses. You'll take one inhale. It'll smell great. Second one will be good. Third one, you won't smell anything at all, you know? Um, I think that it, there, there, maybe there's something there that we can do. You could, you could, you'll have a chance to pontificate on as to why that's true. But um, these peak moments, they come and go, you know? And so when they happen, we need to develop a skill set of relishing it. Like you said earlier, we're, the brain is more predisposed to negative than positive because of survival instinct and all of that, fear easy one to, to press the button. So when good things happen, I'm trying to myself learn to savor the moment, to hang in there. You know, oh, my daughter said something really beautiful. I don't just move on to the next. I'm going to hang in with that for a while, as long as I possibly can, before I jump into the next, you know, scene cut in my life, you know, 
So th- there is something to be valued there. You know, I, I wonder, I mean, you spend so much time observing nature. And to me, the beauty in nature is more of an asymmetrical order than kind of this sort of more symmetrical celebration of mankind. I wonder if you see, if you find that too, it's kind of the imperfections that make it so delicious. Well, there's both. I mean, there is symmetry and there's fractals and there's, you know, flow and spiral and all these patterns. And what's beautiful is that it's universal, that you see it in the Milky Way and you see it in a snail. Um, I see it in, in, in a crack in granite rock, the way things branch. The mycelial network you know, looks like the respiratory system, looks like your circulatory system, looks like your nervous system, you know, looks like your brain. I mean, how, how amazing is all of that? And so, um, again, it's like it, it touches the deepest part of my soul. I feel like I'm an adventurer on a voyage of discovery. If I could find it in a rock, you know, I can find it in the obvious ones like the Milky Way, but I could find it everywhere. And, and that, to me, is a challenge. Without my camera, I look at, I, look at, I, I want to be discovering beauty everywhere I go. I can find it like, you know, in the gutter, you know, watching, you know, water go down and carrying little leaves. And I'm, I'm fascinated, like, which leaf is going to come in first? You know, it's like a kayak race. <laughs> it's like, there it is. There's this whole drama that's happening. And I get sucked into it all the time, probably because I was born in Brooklyn. And the only white water experience was watching, like, you know, popsicle sticks going down the gutter. But I love watching water on concrete. Do you ever do that? Trying to figure out which way it's going to go, like left, right, it's going to follow that crack. I mean, it's the same thing that happens in nature, big storm, and it breaks through a different part of the beach because of this whiplash, like a hose, and every time it's different, and always asking why, and always amazed at at this story that keeps on unfolding. I love that, Louis. There's a word in Chinese... Um, called Li, and um, there's no real translation for it as usual. Um, but the best translation is the markings in jade. But it could really also refer to the the kind of striations of muscle or the swirl in marble, and um, or the you know the course of water. Um, but in the morning after I watched the film. I was in the sauna, I was taking a sauna and it was a wonderful cedar sauna and, uh, and it got really nice and warm and I kind of get into a little breathing routine and I'm just really very comfortable and very open. And I started staring at the grain in wood, um, which really represents the natural flow of sap and I could have stared at that grain of wood, the grain in the wood for like two hours. I mean, and then how it fractaled out and, um, and just the natural spontaneous emergent patterns that are concomitant with nature. I mean, it's just, it's just, uh, again, you know, the reason why, you know, not only is it beautiful, it, it, it is healing. Like the moving art series I have on Netflix, have I've gotten hundreds of comments from people claim that it's a healing modality. Everything from children with autism having major breakthroughs, teenagers that are suicidal, people with cancer, people with depression, post-op, pre-op, end-of-life anxiety. It, and I'm basically just showing rhythms and patterns of nature and, and my thinking as to why is it so powerful. Not that it's just you know nice and beautiful and soothing why is why do people claim that it's a healing modality it's because it's reflecting everything that's going on inside your body those rhythms and patterns look like the cells in your body you know and so you're you're recognizing yourself and i think every cell in your body is rejoicing going i know you you know you're me i get it you know 
This, this, is, this is universal energy. This is how life works. This is how energy moves throughout the universe. I'm looking at how it works. And that's who I am. My body is that. We don't, we're not aware of that very much. But, you know, osmosis, all the scientific words of, of these like functional things that are going on inside of a trillion cells in your body that fucking works is a miracle. And when it looks at itself, it goes, yeah, I want to be part of that. I want to be part of life going forward. I want to be part of a flower that's blooming. I want to be part of life energy because life is a force of energy, you know, and, and I identify with it. And because I identify with it, I feel good. So beautiful. And we're just links in this continuous chain of energy, of energy transfer. Um, it, again, in, in the Alpen glow of watching the film, I started to think about, you know, that all of these atoms self-assembled into cells that then created organs that somehow function together in this symphony that allows me to be here with you <laughs> right now. I mean, if that's not a miracle to be grateful for, I mean, what the heck is, you know? Exactly. Um, yeah. I, you know, I started thinking about just the fusion reaction in the sun that produces a photon that travels to the chloroplast in a leaf that triggers photosynthesis to create, to transfer light energy into chemical energy. So, and to create an apple just right at the perfect height. So I can walk around and just pick it and I can eat that and unlock that chemical energy into mechanical energy. And I mean, it's just nuts, man. It's like, this is just, we have so much to be grateful for if we just stop and pay attention to it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Well, Louis, I am uh, such uh, an admirer um, of your work and you do the world such a great service. Um, it's really fascinating to hear about how moving art has become a therapy for so many people, um, but also just as a collector of stories. Uh, you just really have a way of bending the arc of what it's like to be alive and I'm very grateful for that. So am I, and, and I'm grateful for the fact that you know you're telling all these, uh, you know, great interviewing all these great thought leaders and and sharing your podcast with the world. And you know, we're 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 definitely at a critical time of um, shifting consciousness, you know, because we do have these, you know, this time clock of <clears throat> you know environmental degradation, and we don't want to get you know into a, a downer at the end of this conversation, but. Um, when there's breakdown, there's breakthrough. And and this is a time in history <clears throat> that I think we all chose to be here, to be Jedi warriors, to kick some butt, make it happen, be the change, you know, let's do it. Let's do it. I'm with you. Count me as a supporter. I'm right okay. beside you, locked in arms. Where can people uh, see the film Gratitude Revealed if... Uh, because they've got to be curious by now. <laughs> well, the easiest uh, recommendation is go to gratitudereveal.com. We've made it now. We put it on the platforms like Apple TV and Amazon and, um, and on the website itself. And there are still theatrical screenings we're doing in a number of cities. So gratitudereveal.com would be the perfect way to find out where is the easiest and nearest place you can watch the movie. If you can watch it in the theater, it's really cool because, you know, the, the feeling of community, of, of getting together with people for a film like this especially is wonderful. But any way you're able to view it is a good, is a good way to do it. I completely agree with you. Obviously, I called my business Commune for a reason. I think... Um... The best indicator of health and happiness is the amount of deep social connections that you have. So I would suggest doing what I was lucky enough to do is have a dinner party and watch the movie, but watch the movie first and then have dinner because it is the most animated conversation and it was really went down a whole bunch of different paths. So um, great idea. So I'm a, I'm a proponent of that. But if you can go see it in a theater, man. Um, 
That's awesome. That's where I let the floodgates of beauty uh, overpower you. <laughs> Size matters. Yeah, but either way is great. I hope this can be uh, a conversation to be continued because I'd love to do another session on fungi in particular um, because I'm a mycelium network nut and I'm a big regenerative agriculture supporter and I work with a lot of nonprofits in that space. And um, when you were talking about how mycelium networks look like neuron neural ganglia look like your respiratory system also looks like a fistful of sprouts or a tree or a broccoli spear or whatever. Life is bushy <laughs> when on nature creates bushiness and clumpiness when unimpeded. And, you know, if you look around the world, we're starting to become this very flat world with spikes at the edges. Like when three dudes have more collective wealth than the 50% of the rest of the people combined, or when there's hundred billion sheep, cattle, and pigs, and people, and no other biodiversity. <laughs> we need clumpiness. So um, so hopefully we can talk about uh, mycelium networks on the, on the next one. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.